Alright, so we'll get started. So I should introduce myself. My name's uh, Luke Barnes. I'm at the University of Sydney. I'm a postdoc. I do similar stuff to what, um, to what Joel does. I do galaxy formation, um, those sorts of things. But I'm here to talk about uh, the fine tuning of the universe for, for life. And um, I gave a sort of shortened version of this talk at, at uh, where I work, the, the Sydney Institute for Astronomy. And the talk went for 40 minutes and the questions went for about an hour afterwards, which is highly unusual. So if I take that sort of ratio and factor in that there's physicists and cosmologists and philosophers and David Albert, <laughs> <laughs> we may never leave. So, um, not uncontroversial. So I'm, I'm already licking my lips at the... Uh, at, um, so I, I think the physics of this is great, and it does at least illuminate a lot of the facts about our universe, and uh, it, it raises a whole load of, of, of interesting questions, philosophical questions and cosmological questions. So I'm going to give an overview of, of sort of the science, what, what uh, has been done in the literature, what calculations have been done, I'm going to raise a whole load of questions and then probably hide under the table. Uh, so. If you have any questions, especially if you're a, a, a philosopher or not, or I, you know, I'm an astrophysicist, so if I go past something too fast, please stop me and ask questions. Because if you don't ask easy questions, someone will ask a hard one. <laughs> uh, okay, let me put the claim up straight away, just so we can have it in the corner of our eye. I'm going to, you know, it's the whole topic of this talk, so I'll, um, sorry, Joel, do you have a pointer by any chance? Uh, no. No. Okay, low tech. We're okay. So here's the claim. At the top there, in the set of possible physical laws, parameters, and initial conditions, the subset that permits the evolution of life is very small. Now, all sorts of alarms should be going off at this stage, right? Life, possible, small, it's all there. Okay? <laughs> we'll be going through those in, in, in great detail. So there's a nice summary here by Leonard. Uh, the laws of physics are almost always deadly. In a sense, the laws of nature are like East Coast weather, tremendously variable, almost always awful, but on rare occasions perfectly lovely. That's a nice <laughs> summary for his book. Um, what I'm going to be presenting is the summary of a, a review paper I published in uh, PASA. Uh, so, uh, if you want the, the details, it's there, but I'll be going through a lot of most of that material, I suppose. So, the, the sort of, there's a couple of ways to motivate these sorts of um, considerations. So the one I want to start with is to just say that the universe is not an experiment. If you're an experimenter, the role that initial conditions play are whatever you felt like doing that day. Like you go in and you set up your machine or your, your apparatus to do what, whatever you feel like doing. But that is clearly not the case in the universe. Right? You not only not only do you sort of you take what you're given, it's not just that you walk into the lab and the experiment is already set up. It's the kind of experiment that makes its own experimenter as it goes along. So you, you, you are not Frankenstein, you are the monster. <laughs> okay? Or uh, well, Frankenstein in this case. Congratulations if you get that. Yeah. Uh, so there are these philosophical, the, the, the sleeping beauty problem if you're a philosopher. You know, we, it is very much the case we wake up in a universe and we are looking around at uh, the, the apparatus there and trying to work out what happens. So what I want to do is just, as a first step, to give an overview of how we connect what we understand about the basic laws of nature with what we understand to be at least some of the necessary conditions for life as we know it. And we'll broaden things out after I've done that. So, um, I need a rough definition of life to start with. I'll focus on uh, the two basic things of reproduction and metabolism. So maybe you know the four F's of evolution. Uh, fleeing, fighting, feeding, and reproduction. <laughs> <laughs> Not my joke, but always do it. Uh, that'll be enough for now. You know, if you can do those sorts of things, you know, you're close enough to being alive. So, at the bottom here, um, Try and get out of the way. I'll just list all of the sort of parameters or you know, the, the factors that are going to come into play from the bottom up, from, from physics. Not quite from the bottom up. So the electron, the proton, and the neutron in the same box because they're it, it, the nucleons. 
Now, they're made of quartz, of course, but we'll get to that later. I, I'll just focus on those. So now we have electromagnetism, you're familiar with all of these, of course. Uh, so the photon is the, the, the gauge boson. The weak force, the strong force, we'll talk about the ones if you like. Uh, gravity, sort of floating around in the middle. Uh, so you have sort of particle physics over here, and then the cosmological parameters, the uh, universe is three plus one dimensional. I connected that to cosmology, had second thoughts, and then thought I'll just, if you, if you think that's a cosmological parameter, go for it. And then the standard cosmological parameters. Have a dark energy, have a baryons, the ordinary matter, this, this stuff. Uh, cosmological constant. Q is uh, the uh, initial density, that one part in 10 to the 5 that we see in the cosmic microwave background. Eta is related to the matter antimatter. Um, ratio in the early universe, and I'll, I'll just stick entropy on the end there for fun. It's always hanging around. Um, so, I want to trace all of these up, and so I need a couple of intermediate states for how it happens in our universe. So, this slide is going to get busier and busier, so enjoy. Um, so, we need life to have some sort of substrate that can, can do things. So, importantly, we need something like biochemistry. We need a substrate that can uh, carry information and can uh, you know, do things with that information, not just if, you know, not just lock it away in a safe, but actually, you know, DNA is a great example. It, it not only holds the information, it can every now and then just rip itself in half and make two copies. That's a very nice property. So that depends on in our universe what I'm calling organic chemistry, which is really carbon chemistry. Um, the important uh, Species I'm going to focus on are hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and M because I'm an astronomer. M stands for metals, which is not anything that's not hydrogen and helium. If you want to say M for miscellany, that'll do as well. Obviously, chemistry depends on atoms, which depends on nuclei. Uh, so that's the, the stuff out of which life is made, and the stuff out of which these other things are made. In fact, if it's in synthesis, it's just sort of hanging around in the middle here somewhere, not really connected to anything quite yet. I'm going to say we need a stable environment, so you need somewhere where these things can collect, so information requires a certain amount of stability if you start randomly changing things. Um, that's, that's not going to be particularly good for life. So the way our life does it, we have a planet in a stable orbit around a stable star. That stable star also has an energy, it is, is also the energy source. Um, it, it needs to be usable energy, so there's entropy conditions there as well. To make a planet, you'll need to talk about planet formation. There's questions of star formation, galaxies, and galaxy formation, supernovae. So these are the, the, the things that come into play. So I'm going to now start drawing loads of arrows, just pointing out, to show how we get from this bottom floor there to the top, to the necessary conditions at the top. Obviously, there's a massive question mark over the top of how did life actually originate, and that's the last time I'm going to be mentioning that uh, in, this, in this lecture. Uh, as it comes up. So nuclei. So you have uh, protons and neutrons at the center of, of hopefully you've seen a, a uh, thing like that before. So obviously it's going to depend on the properties of protons and neutrons. It's going to depend on the strong force, obviously. Uh, if it was just electromagnetism, well, everything in there is either neutral or positively charged, so it would be electromagnetically repulsive. So you need the strong force, which you can think of as the protons and neutrons have little muscly arms attached to them. So they only have a finite range, but once you're in that range, they're quite strong. Um, the electron, uh, it, that's a dashed line because we need the electron just to, 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 to stay out of the, 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 the situation. There is electron capture where a, a, a nucleus will capture an electron and a proton becomes a neutron. We, we want that not to happen in general. Uh, the weak force is also important here. Uh, if you, if you put too many protons in the nucleus, there's too much electrostatic repulsion for these short arms to handle, and so the uh, nuclei can fall apart that way. But the neutron itself in free space is unstable, and so if you want to sort of base you know, a heuristic picture of that, if you put too many neutrons in to hold everything together, some of them become isolated and, and want to leave the party. So it, you'll get uh, that. That's a weak force interaction that, that, the neut that neutrons will decay. The all of those forces in balance gives you 
the value of stability. So these are what nuclei are possible. So you have the number of protons here. So this is you just order up a, a, a nucleus. Pick a number of protons, pick a number of neutrons. If it's black, it'll be stable. If it's clear, then it's going to be, it's, yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, if it, there's a radioisotope and if it's red, it's going to be unstable but long lived enough that we've seen it and then there's just sort of nothing out here and here. So what we're seeing is we need, um, for a given number of protons, you need roughly the same number of neutrons just to hold the thing together. And if you're out that way, if you've got too many protons, you fall apart. If you have too many neutrons, you fall apart. And there's a limit up there as well. So that's useful for life. We have a large number of different nuclei. That's nice because it gives us an atomic, uh, sorry, a periodic table of different types of atoms. So, then, so what makes a nuclei into an atom is the electrons going around the outside. So obviously the electrons are important. We need those nuclei. Electromagnetism is what keeps the electron going around the outside. There's a little note here, that needs to be a quantum mechanical force. If in classical theory, the electrons going around the outside will radiate and spiral into the nucleus. That doesn't happen in quantum theory because there is a, a minimal stable state. Um, you also, here's an interesting one, you need three spatial dimensions to have stable atoms. If you have more or less, then uh, there is no ground state. And you, you need, even in quantum mechanics, uh, the electron spirals into the nucleus. So you need that coming in as well. Uh, from atoms, the step to chemistry, by chemistry I mean sort of the properties of the levels, sorry, question? Yeah, I've heard some other arguments for, you know, for having three spatial dimensions having to do with the stability, or the stability of the planetary orbits yep. as well. Um, but uh, there seem like they, those might not be as definitive. I haven't quite heard this one. Can you elaborate a little bit more on? Uh, if you solve the Schrodinger equation in three dimensions, uh, there is no ground state. So the electron just ends up to go electron uh, proton uh, electron captured by the nucleus. That's that's the basic story. It's, it's sort of similar to the, the planet case I'll come to in a minute. Uh, chemistry then is the <laughs> first of many. Just a general question about strategy. Yeah. If so, we're we're you know we're we're making lists of very, very basic properties of the world. The yep. laws of quantum mechanics, electromagnetism, blah, blah, blah. If we're going to go that basic, I mean, I mean, what if somebody says, look, the, the laws of the world could have been, on a microscopic level, very different, right? Maybe there aren't elementary particles at all. Maybe there's just goop, you know, some, some kind of continuous goop. Then maybe there are all sorts of very, very different circumstances. Mm -hmm. Under you know, in philosophy of science, they call this multiple the multiple realizability of, of the special sciences, right? Something like thermo, you know, once upon a time, people thought you know heat was caloric and, and, and there was just this continuous goop and so on and so forth. There are presumably lots of other different fundamental physicses that could realize um, yep. organic chemistry. Are, are we are we are we quantifying over you know are, are we taking probabilities of those two? We're not we're not there yet in, okay. in the argument. Just, okay. just just hold on to that question. Okay. It's uh, it's going to be one of the major responses to what. Okay. Yeah. But let me let me show. So the case is roughly going to be to show how it happens in our universe <laughs> and show what changes as you start fiddling with these knobs and how you interpret that. I'm 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 almost just going to leave that open. Sorry, I was at the point of just saying that chem well, chemistry is the, the, the physics of that outermost electron. Um, there's a surprising, uh, that, that's the only line I need. There's, there's, you can't, the, the, depends on the, the energy levels of, of the electrons the, in atoms as to what chemical properties you get. That follows almost entirely from the Schrodinger equation. If you start changing these parameters, you just change the, the overall scale of these levels, but not each of them individually. So actually, chemistry is remarkably robust when you start changing these, as long as you've got nuclei and atoms. Um, so let's say, 
Let's have a look at hydrogen. How do we get hydrogen in our universe? So you're mostly water, so there's a lot of hydrogen around. Um, the hydrogen that we obviously need it to be a stable state, uh, a stable atom. So there's that arrow. The hydrogen in your body is left over from the Big Bang. So it, it, it gets used up in the universe, but not really sort of created here. Um, so we need, that's going to depend on Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And what we need here is just the Big Bang nucleosynthesis to just leave the hydrogen alone for the most part. So that depends on a large number of both uh, these factors and, and the cosmology factors. Let me quickly run through how this works. If you're nucleosynthesis, obviously that's protons and neutrons are involved. You're trying to um, smash these together. So electromagnetism in, is uh, involved because some of them will be repulsive. There's also a scattering of electrons. And the photons are around the, sort of, uh, the temperature of the whole system is really the temperature of the photons. That's where most of the energy is. Um, strong force is obviously involved. If you've got protons and neutrons, it's going to depend on how much um, what the ratio of uh, ordinary matter to uh, antimatter is, because that will set the ratio of ordinary matter to photons once they've once annihilated. Um, so it's also going to depend on the, the density of baryons uh, in total, and there's actually a very good way of measuring the density of baryons. The one you might not guess is the weak force, which is actually quite important to this. Um, in the early universe, you have a roughly equal amount of protons and neutrons. Once you get to nucleosynthesis, if that was the state, most of those uh, things are going to pair, pair off firstly into deuterium and then into helium-4, which has two protons and two neutrons. So if uh, it's hot enough for that to work pretty much 100, with 100% efficiency. So if you had equal numbers of protons and neutrons, you'd have almost an entirely helium universe, and so no leftover hydrogen. Um, the weak force sort of comes to the rescue here in that uh, neutrons are, free neutrons are unstable. So there is a period in, during which um, neutrons will decay. Let's simplify the story a bit. So that once nucleosynthesis starts, you know, not everyone at the dance pairs off. There's too many protons. So when, every, when, when the lucky few have paired off with the neutrons left over, uh, you still have left over free protons, which are those hydrogen atoms. Um, if you want to make these other, anything that's not hydrogen or helium, so carbon and oxygen specifically. Sorry, I should mention why I'm focusing on carbon and oxygen. Just because I've said what we, we want life to have information and to do something with that information. So the long chain carbon molecules are the way that you hold that information. And the most important uh, energy reactions for life usually involve oxygen. So it's, it's sort of, they're there as the sort of the, the, fl the flagship elements for holding information and doing something with it. It's also relevant to know, that, as you know and I know, but not everybody, that those are also the next two most common elements yeah. in the universe yeah, yeah. after hydrogen and helium. Yes. Then it's oxygen and then carbon. Because uh, they are made in stars. So you don't make these elements very trace amounts of carbon. But basically, you don't make these elements in uh, the Big Bang. They're made in stars. So some of those will get out directly via uh, things like stellar winds that the star will just blow off the outside uh, out of those atoms. But most of them will get out via supernovae. So when the star gets to the end of its life, don't pack it away nicely in its little black box. Uh, blow it up so that these, these elements which we need for life, I mean, they're made in a, in a ridiculously hot, you know, gravitationally bound thermonuclear bomb, right? We're gonna need to get them out if we wanna have them making um, people and those, those sorts of things. Um, so the next step I wanna look at is, is galaxies. Uh, Joel, I think, gave you an overview of galaxy formation. A lot of this, comes down to these cosmological parameters which we uh, discussed in, in detail. Some of the crucial ones are um, galaxies grow by just you know, the rich get richer. If you're a blob of stuff, then uh, gravity will make sure other things fall towards you and you'll get bigger. So we need those initial perturbations in Q. Um, once uh, the cosmological constant takes over, uh, Structure formation essentially stops. 
So there's a nice limit on, there's an up or down there on the lambda. Um, so gravity is also obviously very important. Uh, also very important is electromagnetism. What's going to set up here is you're going to have a, a balance between gravity pushing in and thermal pressure or pushing out. Now, that's going to set in at a point where there's, it, it's not dense enough to make anything interesting. So to upset that balance, you need this thing, you need one of them to blink in that fight. And uh, <laughs> gravity never blinks, so it's going to have to be electromagnetism. Um, scatterings of electrons of uh, nuclei and uh, various uh, line processes mean that you can turn the kinetic energy of uh, the thermal motions into photons. If those photons escape the system, then the system is losing energy. And that's exactly what you want. You want the system to lose energy so it can keep on collapsing. So the standard picture is that uh, this happens <coughs> faster than uh, the system can compensate for it so that the whole system will collapse until angular momentum uh, kicks in and so you have a rotationally supported but much smaller galaxy. Any further fragmentation then doesn't happen as this thing collapses towards one massive thing at the center, it happens in the disk. So you don't have it up with one massive black hole, you end up with a disk of stars. That's a very oversimplified view of galaxy formation. Um, so this is my field, so I can't uh, resist. All these sorts of things feed back. If you're in a galaxy, you make a star, the star blows up. That's going to affect the next generation of gas that comes in. Question? Yeah. Back to the number of spatial dimensions said, I noticed you have almost all the arrows drawn from the bottom, case, but not 3 plus 1 dimension. Is there a reason why a galaxy dimension wouldn't work in higher numbers of dimensions, for example? Um, I have looked into that, I'm afraid. My suspicion is you might have the same sort of instability you get in the planet case, but I don't think anyone's run a, a cosmological structure formation simulation in four dimensions. I'd love to see it, but uh, I'd love to see how they visualize it. Mm. But, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard enough as it is. Uh, so, yeah, these sorts of things all feed back. So, uh, I, I, I spent a week at a conference in a lovely tropical island of Queensland, which was all about feedback processes. So, uh, just to put those in there. Um, given a slightly oversimplified picture, I need to show pictures of galaxies. Because I'm an astronomer, and you must show a pretty picture at some stage in your core. That's uh, it's, it's just part of the deal. So this is a disk galaxy. There is another form of galaxy which you don't see as often because they're not pretty <laughs> called elliptical galaxies, which are just a ball of stars in a sort of um, football shape sort of thing. Oh, yeah. That doesn't translate. Or does it? American football? Yeah, sort of yeah, elongated, yeah. oval, 3D oval kind of shape. If you're from England, I apologize. It's not always a sphere. Um, okay. Oh, sorry, I covered this already, but uh, it's these sorts of um, complications in galaxy formation that mean I have a job, so uh, I'm very grateful to them. I did my PhD thesis on uh, the radiative transfer of one particular line in hydrogen in, in uh, proto galaxies. It was a tremendous, tremendous you know, story, great characters. Um, <laughs> star formation. Let's go quickly through this. Uh, the, the moral of the story here is that gravity is trying to crush everything. So um, we just need to let it. So again, you get cooling, which is going to let gravity crush things in the stars. Obviously, gravity is the main thing. You need things to be dense enough. The cooling rate depends on how dense things are. The denser things are, the more things collide. The more photons you make, the faster they escape. The more things collapse. That's why it's a runaway process. So you need the gas to be in galaxies. You need, uh, hydrogen is going to be a main coolant in star formation, particularly the hydrogen molecule, but you'll also get some help from these other things by uh, what astronomers call dust, which is basically anything that gets in the way of the thing that you're trying to look at, uh, unless you look at dust, in which case you make wonderful photographs like these. This is a region about 75 light years across from the Orion uh, constellation, where you see the new young blue stars just lighting up these giant clouds of, of, of gas and ionized hydrogen. It's, we live in a universe where that sort of thing is out there. 
wonderful and beautiful. Stable stars, um, Fred did a wonderful job of summarizing it, so I don't have to do too much. Um, it, it's, it's gravity versus thermal pressure in a star. So that thermal pressure comes from collisions between uh, most of the electrons and the most important ones, so the electromagnetic uh, collisions. Um, you need, the star will leak energy, which is sunlight, so that's a good thing. Um, but you're going to need to replenish that energy, that's going to come through nuclei, um, the maybe protons and neutrons should be attached there as well, and the strong force. You also need the weak force. The main uh, way that energy is produced in especially small stars, uh, you have four, you start with four protons and you end up with a helium-4 molecule, molecule, nuclei. Um, you notice that does that, that's four protons, and you end up with two protons and two neutrons, so you need that transition that the weak force can do between protons and neutrons to have that work. Um, you need, for this to happen, you need fuel. So you need that leftover hydrogen. If you try to power a star on anything other than hydrogen, yeah, it will burn out quicker. So if you do it with helium, I think it's about a factor of 30 or more. Um, certain stars require, sorry, you make use of uh, other reactions to burn hydrogen. Um, something called the CNO cycle, but I won't go into that. Um, supernovae, I've told you, are useful because um, the carbon that's going to become you is in this layer, and we need to get it out. So in a very big star, when it gets to the end of its life, it heats up in the centre. So the centre gets hotter and hotter, so that the reactions there are faster. So this burning towards larger nuclei uh, happens at different rates in different radii. So you get this uh, shell structure where you have iron burning in the middle and then various layers of things burning on the way out. Um, uh, that's a nice thing, if, even if the, the center totally obliterates itself, so this carbon and hydrogen and, and, and oxygen will be there when the middle goes supernova. So if things perfectly churn themselves up, you might just have an entirely iron star. In which case, even if it blew up, you only get iron out of it. But we get all of those elements out there in the universe, thanks to this sort of onion-like structure. Supernovae uh, depends on the fact that nuclei, you can't keep burning them together, you're smashing them together and get more and more energy. After iron, if you try and bash two irons together, that uses up energy rather than puts out energy. So that's pretty catastrophic when that happens in the middle. You know, that energy was fighting gravity. If it then starts you know, cooperating with gravity, you're in real trouble. Uh, um, neutrinos are believed to be involved in actually providing the pressure that blows uh, these outer layers away. Modeling supernovae is difficult. There's also magnetic fields and other sorts of complications in there. So. Um, I won't go into that too much. Uh, a couple more of these and we're done. Um, planet formation. We need all of these lovely things that we've made to collect somewhere. So we're going to need planets. So we need, once again, gravity just pumps things together. The difference is now the things you're pumping together are actually sticky. They will stick to each other. So that's an important thing. But once again, you need sooner to go off in galaxies so that you can collect all this stuff. It won't just blast its way back across the universe. Um, this will happen around stable stars. So the standard picture, this is a... Thank you. Okay. That's the sort of artist's impression of what's happening in these, these early... Uh, when a star first fires up, it's surrounded by this disk of, of material. Uh, some of it will be blown away when the star flies up, and some of it will collect and clump into, uh, into planets. Um, that's pretty much all I want to say there. Oh, it's, it's the atomic forces that are important here, that clumping. Um, good. Planets, I've basically described what's going on there. It's what, what's fighting, gravity is holding the thing together. What's fighting gravity is the atomic forces, that stuff is, is hard. Um, you obviously need planet formation. And the whole point of this thing is that we want to collect this stuff onto one area. So we can make that a warm still pond that Darwin wanted, um, so that, that life can happen. As mentioned before, if you want a stable orbit, 
you want a stable source of energy, so you, that energy is coming from a star, so you'd like to keep it a, a constant distance away from that star. Um, that requires, uh, planet formation is actually crucial here, in that disk, uh, if a planet is moving, uh, changing its radius, it's running into more things in the disk. So there's a sort of a braking mechanism there that's going to make, make things tend to go around on roughly circular orbits, so they minimize that, that friction. friction. Um, gravity, it was mentioned before that uh, uh, if you have more than three spatial dimensions, so if you have a four-dimensional universe, if you have a perfectly circular orbit, that's fine. But if you kick it a little bit, it either spirals outwards or spirals into the star. So actually the only number of spatial dimensions where you get the sort of orbit where uh, if you have a circular orbit, you give it a bit of a kick, you get a, a slightly elongated elliptical orbit instead of uh, spiraling in or out using three dimensions. Um, galaxies I've thrown in there just because once you've formed your solar system, you would like the rest of the galaxy to leave it alone. Don't send a star through there, right? If you want nice stable orbits, then um, you, want it, you want that to happen in a fairly uh, low density of uh, galaxies. One of the reasons why we need space to be nice and big and spacious is because there are a lot of the things out there we don't want anywhere around here. Um, one final thing, just before we get going, um, we need some connection between organic chemistry and the energy put out by the stable star. So there is a, um, if you want photosynthesis, you need the energy in each photon that's coming out of your star to be usable to organic kind of processes, things like photosynthesis. So the fact that those two are the same order of magnitude gives you a rather striking coincidence, uh, which I'll get to very soon. Um, and so, in summary, <laughs> uh, so I started thinking about this slide and thought I need a big whiteboard, and so I went into one of the lecture rooms and, and started writing all this stuff down and started drawing lines. And if you've seen the movie A Beautiful Mind, there's the point where the, <laughs> the wife walks in and sees the connections he's making and realizes that he's gone mad. <laughs> I hope no one walks in. I'm going to have a lot of explaining. Uh, so that was the explaining. So this um, is a great story for a start. This is, I think this is wonderful, wonderful physics. The story of how um, this is the sort of precursor to uh, abiogenesis, that, that what you need to do in our universe before you get life like us. Um, so the next thing I want to do uh, is ruin everything. <laughs> Saw that movie for the first time the other day. Really good. Uh, this is wreck it Ralph, if you uh, haven't seen it. Go find a small child as an excuse to go and see it. <laughs> <It's awesome. laughs> um, but a lot of that, a lot of this picture changes rather dramatically as I change these concepts. Now, what we should conclude from that, we'll, we'll know that keep us busy for a while. But I just wanted to show how that happens, and then we'll, we'll, we'll try and work out what it means later. But you can, I mean, you can do an awful lot of cutting of all these different lines in a way that nothing else happens further up. Um, so. Um, let, me just, let me just give a quick precursor to the sort of calculations that, that we're going to do. So, what, we, what we're trying to do, this is a very dangerous slide to show to a bunch of uh, philosophers of science, but what we're trying to do when we do physics, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I try to do. Okay? Start with some theory. If that theory is true, then we expect to observe some sort of observations. Our actual observations, though, are consistent with, within the error bars, OT. Therefore, uh, therefore, I've written a paper, please give me more ground on um, it. <laughs> step two is the one I want to focus on. Um, usually what this T involves, I mean, we say it's the laws of nature, the fundamental constants, the initial conditions. What this usually looks like is you've got uh, some sort of equation, the constants of nature, equations that are the sort of parameters that go into that equation, and the initial conditions. Uh, when you solve this equation, you have a set of solutions. If you want to pick out a particular solution, you need to put more, feed more numbers in. And the initial conditions are the usually what, usual way to do that, but any sort of boundary conditions will do. Um, so. 
what we're doing when we when we change the laws of nature is just uh, redoing this step two for some other theory. This is this is basically what step two does. If such and such were true, we would expect to see so and so in the universe. Okay, it's important to note that. Um, when you actually go and do observations and find that these are consistent, that doesn't tell you you did too right. Okay? Finding out that the orbits, the orbit of the Earth is an ellipse around the Sun doesn't tell you you solved the equation right. You need to have done too properly, right? If you're a theoretical physicist, you need to have done your job properly. So the, the sort of calculations we're going to do are just theoretical physics. They're not like what theoretical physics it just is theoretical physics. If the universe were like such and such, then so and so would happen. Um, observations will tell us whether t is true, but they won't. The, this if t, then o t. You, you, you're all on your own with the mathematics on that one. Um, so, um, one of the fun things you do as a theoretical physicist is you can play with your model to actually see what happens when you start changing these parameters. So, suppose you're You've got a model for, so you've got some code that will calculate gravitational uh, uh, lensing. So here we are on Earth, there is some distant source of light which has it approaches some giant cluster of galaxies, goes this way and goes that way around, so you see distorted images and multiple images. So if you have a code like that, you could apply it to our universe and, and see what sense you can make, see what you can conclude about the, the galaxy cluster when you see something like. Uh, this galaxy cluster, where it's, these, it's these arcs that are, that are giving away the fact that there is a gravitational, gravitational lens in there. So you could apply it to the real world. Alternatively, you could do what Mike Hudson of uh, University of Waterloo did and answer the age-old question, what it would be like if the distant universe contained a giant photograph of my own head and a, <laughs> a, a, a black hole wandered past. So, now you know. Uh, this idea that we, uh, when we're solving the equations, we, we, we sort of look at what, what the universe, uh, we, we do these hypothetical universes. Um, so, yeah, let's jump straight in. So now we're actually going to start kicking the universe around and, and seeing what happens. Just from a paper by uh, Bar and Carr, uh, and from a junior of the week scale, etc. So this, this is a slice through parameter space. MU is the mass of the aquar, the units of Planck mass, and for reasons I don't understand, they took the natural log of that, um, the log base 10. Um, yeah, um, this is the, down, the, the same thing but for the down quark. So you have the boundaries on parameter space, which are roughly at the top, uh, is roughly the Planck mass. I, th I think uh, I think they actually assume that the Higgs vacuum expectation value was at the Planck mass. So the factor of I think it's about six there is due to the if you're interested in the details, but the upper parameter, the one. The lower limit there is due to. Um, something called, sorry, uh, dynamical breaking of chiral symmetry by QCD. You know, I want to explain that to me later, feel free. We're going to ignore these couple lines. We're going to zoom in on this little bit. There's us there, okay? Block scale, uh, we're going to zoom in on that part of the block and ask what happens as we move away a little bit. Interesting stuff happens. All right, here's the details. If you're above line one, that blue line at the top, then you only have one stable nuclei, which is the delta plus plus particle. So not only is there only one element in your periodic table, it has the chemistry of helium, which is to say it has no chemistry at all. There are no chemical reactions in that universe. If you are to the right of number nine, you have roughly the same problem, but you now have the delta minus particle. Again, no nuclei, and the only thing around is the chemistry of hydrogen, which gives you roughly one chemical reaction. Um, still not particularly useful. Let's have a look at these pair of lines, these green ones, 3 and 8. If you're above 3, uh, then 
that the neutrons inside a nuclei will decay. Um, so that glue that's holding nuclei together uh, falls apart even inside a nucleus. So in above this line, your periodic table consists only of hydrogen. If you're to the right, to sorry, below the green curve, then you have the opposite problem that protons inside nuclei decay. So in that case, you have no periodic table at all. You just have neutrons. Great big balls of neutrons, no chemistry, no nothing. Um, uh, what's next? What are Let's do, uh, where's five? Yeah, five, this one. Uh, if you are on the wrong side of five, um, the production of deuterium in stars absorbs energy rather than releasing it. Uh, it's also unstable to weak decay. So the first step of doing anything in stars is that two protons will form a deuterium. Uh, nuclei, which is one proton and one neutron. Uh, so if you're on the wrong side of that, 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 um, I'll come back to this point in a bit more detail, but uh, that uh, process will um, absorb energy rather than giving it off, so it won't help you fight gravity. Um, six and seven, if you're below that line six, this one, uh, then uh, a proton and a nucleus can capture an electron, so protons inside atoms are unstable. So you just, uh, things, yeah, all your atoms fall apart. If you're below seven, uh, isolated protons are unstable. So all that hydrogen left over from the Big Bang just dissolves into clouds of neutrons. And uh, well, you have no hydrogen around to fuel stars, you have no hydrogen around to play a role in organic chemistry. And hydrogen is one of the main uh, coolants in the universe, and so there's a question of whether neutrons would be able to cool enough to do anything interesting at all in, the, in a cosmological context. The last two are two and four. If you're above number two, that sort of purpley pinky line there, then um, the deuteron is strongly unstable. Same problem as before that first step in, in stellar burning. Uh, absorbs, uh, sorry, falls apart before uh, anything else can happen. If you're below four, you have the opposite sort of problem. So uh, above two, a pro, uh, uh, if you take a proton and a neutron and stick them together, they will fall apart. If you're below four, if you take two protons and stick them together, they will stay stuck together. Now, um, it was originally thought that this would be a, a catastrophe because in the sun it would be way too easy for um, of course, nuclear synthesis would just be too fast, right? You need it to be sort of slow enough that, that your star churns out energy for a couple of billion years because it's your energy source. Um, it's not entirely clear, giving the first of a series of caveats, that, that four would be a disaster. There's a worry there that you'll burn too much. You won't have any hydrogen left over from the Big Bang. And there's a worry that stars will either not form at all, but either not fire up at all, Sorry, sorry, fire up too easily and too quickly. Um, but that's a case where I wouldn't mind seeing a bit more work. And so the region which survives these um, different criteria is uh, that little green triangle. Um, for the purpose of illustration, this is a log log plot. If I did this plot not with logs, not on a logarithmic scale, just on a, the normal scale, a linear scale, then uh, for that little triangle to be visible to the human eye, the board would have to be 25 light years high. Um, so, this seems to be the plot that most people, that sort of sticks in people's heads from, from this kind of talk. I'll give you a few more examples of, of this sort of fine tuning, but I think this is going to be the one that people will say. What exactly is the question this paper is trying to answer? What happens when you change? I mean, for the moment, all I'm saying is, what what would these other, would these other universes be like if I started messing with the, the constants of physics? And we'll move on from that question later. Okay, sorry. Um, so this is up, down, up quark and down quark. Sorry, to make a proton, you need two up quarks and a down quark. To make a neutron, you need one up quark and two down quarks. So this is the stuff that makes protons and neutrons. Um, the electron is also in there, so now this axis is the down 
minus the upflight mass and we have the electron mass down here. So we have similar sorts of bound here. You have no nuclear, there's you have no atoms because nuclei will swallow your electrons here in this section. And the deuteron will be unbound with you up there. So again, it leaves you with this nice little triangle. Um, you can translate these into more fundamental um, parameters of the standard model if you like. So this is the bound on the Higgs va uh, vacuum expectation value expressed in Planck units. Um, so if you're on the left, I should get this right. Uh, if you're on the left, then your nuclei, below, on that way your nuclei eat electrons. So they just all disappear into a, a, a cloud of neutrons. And if you're out that way, uh, then um, there is no nuclear binding at all. Uh, there, nothing in the periodic table will hold together. Um, let me take a couple of different slices through parameter space. I'll run through this uh, quickly. Um, it's, let's look at, on this axis, the ratio of the electron mass to the proton mass commonly called beta, and now we've got the fine structure constant on this axis. Uh, these axes are uh, scaled so that zero and infinity are, are on the same block. And so we see a whole load of different um, criteria here. Um, if you're in this region here, there are no solids. So that uh, quantum uncertainties of, it, the way you melt something is you have a lattice of stuff and if you heat it up enough that the thermal instability start moving things around and you've melted the thing. In this region, quantum uncertainty is enough to do that for just about anything. So there are no solid structures in this region. I've talked about the unstable proton, you just get a universe full of neutrons <coughs> and no atoms. This is Fred's um, criterion. So if you're in that region, you have no stable stars because anything big enough to burn is big enough to blow itself apart. Um, you remember from Fred's plot that there are actually two sides to that. So that's the, the, the right-hand side. This is the one from the other side, which uh, wasn't able to express as a function of, of electron mass to proton mass. So it's just a one-dimensional thing there. Um, Six is a bit of a disaster. In this case, electrons going around uh, electrons going around in orbits around atoms are relativistic, and so there's enough energy there to to have uh, electron-positron pair creation, which then creates a, a, the potential for them to then annihilate and produce a photon. That photon will have more than enough energy to create all sorts of disasters. Uh, what happened? I mentioned ah, this dotted line is an interesting. One. You have, along this dotted line, through a rough calculation, the energy per photon put out by stars is roughly equal to the energy per molecular bond. So that you can interpret as the photosynthesis line. If you want to actually get uh, chemical energy out of sunlight, you need to be somewhere on that dotted line. Uh, that involves a really interesting sort of connection of these constants. It's um, there's no, you've got to notice, there's no region there, there's no boundary. You just need to be roughly somewhere, but how wide that is, is, is sort of a tough thing to predict. Um, yeah, let's do it. This is Fred's plot. So, uh, what I showed you there was sort of this line. I wanted to make a couple of comments here, and then if Fred wants to, to jump in, go for it. Um, Calculation is lovely. Uh, but there's a question of uh, whether this means that the universe is less fine-tuned or more fine-tuned than we thought. Uh, I've read the literature as much as possible. Before Fred wrote his paper, there were only two constraints that I can find on this parameter space. One is roughly this line, which is in Barrow and Tipler's 1986 book, which is a rough uh, bound on, on alpha, but would be vertical. And the other one is uh, Martin Rees discussed uh, not the stability of stars, but the lifetime of stars. They burn out faster if G is too large. And I think the number he came up with was about a factor of 10 to the 6, which gives you a horizontal line going sort of that way. 
So that was the state of play before Fred wrote his paper. So actually, what Fred did was actually knock out this pizza slice. Right? So um, whether this is large or small, we can discuss later. But you know, it's a log plot, and there's questions about how you should scale these axes. But uh, I think that was the effect of that paper. It was it was grabbed onto by the blogosphere, and especially I don't know, Fred. Had, <laughs> there's always the pro trouble of uh, science journalists and trying to explain these things. But how how, uh, how to interpret this? Um, let's do one more of these. So. Find structure constant again, but now we've got the strong force. Some of the same things are here. That's the stable diproton. Ten is you have an unstable deuterium, um, unstable proton again. If you're in this region, then carbon and all larger elements are unstable. So your your periodic table has all the most boring elements in it, um, and you can't make long chains. You can't really do much. I'll come back to that in a second. Three here is amusing. Uh, if you're in three, then there is no uh, energy jump between nuclear reactions and chemical reactions. So the reason why you can't do alchemy in our universe, like all the fires you like, right? The amount of energy you get out per particle from a chemical reaction like burning fire is a factor of about a hundred thousand short of what you need to do any nuclear reaction. So, you know, light all the fires you like. You're never going to set off a nuclear reaction. That's a, a, a fact about the constants of nature. So if you're in this region, then they're of roughly the same strength. So if you leave your cake in the oven for too long, it, you might come back to a burnt cake, or you might come back to a lump of lead. Uh, okay, rather amusing. Um, I might come back to this in a bit more detail later. The problem with a criterion like that is that it's a, it, the difference from that universe to our universe is a step upwards in complexity and you know, it would be much more difficult to predict what would happen in that universe. Things are complicated enough with uh, chemical reactions in our universe. If you had to factor in the possible nuclear reactions that could also happen for that energy standard as well, it would be horrendously more complicated. So while that seems like it would be a disaster for life as we know it, it's actually quite hard to make that case because it would be a more complicated universe. So fine-tuning cases are at their best when the difference between that universe and ours is a step, uh, is a step towards simplicity, a radical step towards simplicity. You know, just kick out the whole periodic table and, and chemistry becomes really easy. You know, all your chemistry textbooks are a page long. So, um, uh, a quick point about carbon, why carbon is so important. Um, what this plot list is for all the first 10 elements in the periodic table, uh, how many compounds you can make using that element and hydrogen. So there's one for hydrogen, it can bond to itself, but that's about it. None for helium, because it does nothing. None for neon, on the other end, that does nothing. Unless you're getting sort of seven there. And for carbon, you get about 2,300. So it, 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 there's a worry that we're sort of carbon chauvinistic about life, but I don't think it's, it, there's the case to be made there that this is, that, that carbon is important. Uh, on the previous slide, maybe I was thinking you missed this, but when you say alpha s, what energy scale are you measuring there? Ooh, Not this one. But... Oh, sorry. Uh, at... It's not a constant, so I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I'm basically following the discussion in Barrow and Tipler. And I, I, I think it's at. Uh, sorry, I have to look at the details. Because it doesn't make. Yeah, for the fire structures as well, we can just have a low energy limit. But you, right, you can't say that. For, 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 it might be at the Z of those scale, does that make sense? Uh, sorry, I'd have to look at the details. And what does unstable proton mean? Uh, free protons decay into neutrons. So in our universe, if I have a neutron in my hand, it's just wait a bit and it becomes a proton. If you're in that bit, okay. yes. At some point, I want to ask you whether it makes any sense to go that way. No. Yeah? So <laughs> the theory falls apart? Is that? I mean, yeah. It, well, I don't think it's fair to say we know what would happen. If, if alpha were strong, 
then the running with energy would be important, but also everything is non-perturbative and it's yeah. a totally different universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, good. Oh, yeah. So this is why I, <laughs> I'm not a chemist, because I did first year carbon chemistry, but this is a nightmare. And uh, went and did a physics degree. <laughs> uh, <laughs> alkene, alkane, alkyne. Uh, um, so there's a famous case of fine tuning uh, due to what's called the triple alpha resonance. Uh, uh, sorry, a, re a resonance, the triple alpha process. So there's a, a, a resonance in carbon. So if you want to make carbon in stars, um, without this special resonance in carbon, you would put two, two helium atoms together, you would make beryllium, but then that would fall apart this way before any of that happened. So, uh, on the basis of the fact that there is carbon in the universe, and not on the basis of the fact that carbon is needed for life, I can get back to that in a second. On the basis of that fact, Fred Hoyle predicted um, that there must be an as yet undiscovered um, resonance level in carbon, and then went and looked for it and found it. Really nice story about sort of uh, predictions and the interaction of a theory that you could, if we think we understand stars well enough to know what carbon looks like down in its energy levels. A really nice story. Um, so, uh, the paper at the top there. Uh, so, that seemed like a surprising fact, but the question is, okay, if I start messing with these parameters of physics, is it, will that level change, or is it pretty much stuck there, is it just a sort of part of the furniture, or is it uh, a very special feature of our universe? And it turns out from that paper that um, if you change the, the sum of the light quark masses by around about a percent, um, uh, sorry, sort of two to five percent maybe. Uh, you you have you make stars which can make either carbon or oxygen, but not both. Um, and let me just jump back to this plot. So on this plot, as the as as that part as that life permitting criterion went past our universe, it would be about on this scale zero point one. So that's sort of the, one of the tightest bounds you can have. If you, if you want a, a universe that will make carbon, then uh, you need to do that thing. Then you, then you need to... Don't freeze. Okay. Uh, then, then, then you need to have that energy level at just the right place. Uh, cosmological bounds. I can run through this fairly straightforwardly. Um, so this is from a paper called Dimensionless Constants, Cosmology and Other Dark Matters by uh, Max. Anthony, Martin Rees, and the work experience kid, uh, Frank Wilczek. Wilczek? Uh, yeah, okay. Who has a Nobel Prize in Harvard. Um, nice paper, this one. Um, I've given this talk loads of times. I've never given it with so many of the people I'm actually, whose work I'm discussing, I can see them your Very off -putting. Um Okay, so. On this axis, this is just another slice through parameter space. On this axis, you have the matter density per CMB photon, and this is that Q parameter, uh, log scale again. Um, and so you have various uh, seeming disasters that would happen to galaxy formation and from their star and planet formation. So let me go through them. At the very top, things are so uh, clumpy in the early universe that you make black holes uh, rather than. Um, any, anything as nice as a nice spiral galaxy of stars. You have potentially, uh, plausibly, I think, more black hole trouble in this region. Um, things will start to collapse while the pressure is still um, uh, relativistic, so still uh, radiation pressure dominated, which as Fred ex explained is not a stable situation. So uh, you would get that runaway collapse. Uh, potentially to a black hole, at least into something uh, very, very dense. In the red region, your galaxies are plausibly... Note the question mark. Oh, I asked Anthony what the question mark was. Exactly. Uh, plausibly too dense. If you set up a solar system, a planetary system, stars would wander past too often. 
you, you wouldn't have a stable orbit of a planet around a star. Um, you get no star formation in galactic disks if you're in this region. Um, if you're in this region, that cooling that we need for galaxies to form uh, will take longer than the Hubble time, and so you get uh, you're in trouble there because cooling really doesn't do much. And uh, so that's it, on the, on, and it doesn't do much on the sort of scale of the, the life of the universe. And if you're in this region, then it really doesn't do that much at all. So um, these are not. A lot of these cases are not minor perturbations on, on what galaxy, you know, you get an extra spiral arm here or it'll look a bit different, maybe you get a few more different shapes. A lot of these, with the exception of the close encounters one, you would get a, a very dramatic but different looking universe. Um, perhaps the most famous case these days is the cosmological constant, which uh, I'm showing here. The cosmological constant is on in um, Planck units, is on this axis. And you have this combination of uh, Q and whatever that Greek letter is, C, Z, thank you. Um, <coughs> it's, it's in here somewhere, but the pressure doesn't come out. Um, so it's fairly, fairly straightforward ones here. If you're in this region, you just don't get any structure in the universe at all. So it spans too fast for, for things to start clumping together. Um, you're too diffuse. Uh, for galaxies to cool, and if you're down here and you're too dense for for, uh, for planetary systems to be stable if you're up there, and so you have this sort of region where, take, take the orange one, the white one, where, where things can form. Um, this is actually uh, worthy of a, of a bit of a closer look. So this is the cosmological constant problem, which is uh, well, arguably the most severe theoretical problem today, the cosmological constant is arguably the most severe theoretical problem today uh, in high energy physics, as measured both by the difference between observations and theoretical predictions and by the lack of convincing theoretical ideas which address it. So this is from a, a textbook on particle physics. So this is a particularly uh, uh, bad problem, uh, a particularly sort of convincing anthropic case. Uh, for a number of people, for a number of reasons, that you have, first of all, you have this uh, prediction from quantum field theory. You take your field and you work out how much uh, energy there is in it, which would give you an effective cosmological constant. When you do that prediction, you get a number which, um, sorry, that's something else. On this scale, is one, and so the observed value being sort of 10 to the minus 120 is, is a rather spectacular. Uh, Failure of prediction. There are a number of reasons why this is a particularly sticky problem. Question? It, it seems it's, it's interesting that the, in this anthropically allowed region, that the, the dark energy density is kind of almost as large as it can be. Yeah. Um, yes. So that will come back to whether you can use. Um, so if you want to make a prediction of what. The, uh, the cosmological constant you would expect if there was a multiverse, and that was the explanation for this, you would expect, well, you would expect the observed value to be roughly the same order of magnitude as wherever that limit is on that side. So this is exactly what Weinberg did in 1987, and shockingly almost got it right. So sort of in 1998, 10, 11 years later, it was found that this prediction was almost spot on. Um, he only varied one parameter at a time, so I'll go into the details of, of the various caveats on that calculation uh, in a moment. Sorry, uh, quickly, why the cosmological constant is such a problem? Um, first reason is actually several problems. So the cosmological constant itself is, is that number which appears in Einstein's field equations. But there are terms in this, this is the energy density of the universe, there are terms in here which will behave like this term. So when you actually observe it, you generally move this term over, which is why that minus sign is there. You have uh, the sort of bare cosmological constant plus whatever terms that act like a cosmological constant that come from the energy density of the universe. So this is a sum over a whole heap of different terms. And this quantum field theory calculation is of you know, 10 to the 125 watts observed is 
for each of these. So there's actually sort of a number of cosmological constant problems. This, you know, pick a number, you know, have, have a number of people, five or six people, pick a number at random between 1 and 120. Sorry, minus 120 and plus 120, and then add them up, and they all add up to 1. Right, that's, that's basically the cosmological constant problem. Um, it appears that general relativity won't help for two reasons, because there's nothing in general relativity that tells you what that number is, and even if there was, it would only be this term, and it wouldn't be the actual one that's causing the problem. Uh, plausibly, particle physics won't help. Um, Non-gravitational physics is, is not is, is blind to the absolute energy, uh, so that this vacuum energy, uh, sorry, that, um, particle physics is blind to the the actual absolute value of the cosmological constant. It only depends on energy differences. So particle physics uh, and sort of standard model physics, uh, if it landed us at near zero or at zero, it would be a sort of fluke, it's blind to where that zero is because it's gravitational physics that, that actually depends on where that constant is on an absolute scale. Um, for it isn't just a problem at the Planck scale, it's a low energy sort of problem um, it, on, on, on order of electron volts, so the Planck scale is, is, is 10 to the 19 giga electron volts, I think. Um, if you say it's not a cosmological problem, it's some other form of energy, then you just, you, you just kick the problem over, plausibly. You just have another form of energy which is going to uh, potentially have the same sorts of problems. There's no a priori reason to think that it would have exactly the right energy or even be in the right order of magnitude to have the right sort of energy. Um, since 1998, as I said, the, the cosmological constant isn't, we know it's not zero, or the effective observed cosmological constant. So a symmetry, some sort of symmetry that we're not quite sure of, it would be easiest for that to aim for zero somehow, but we, we can't do that anymore. You've still got to, you know, you've, still got to, you've got to cancel out the first 120 decimal places, but not the rest. Um, seven, if inflation happened, then a life prohibiting acceleration is physically possible. So you can't rule this out by somehow tweaking your equations so that you prevent a vacuum energy or this of some you, know, you can't have it too strong. You can't invoke some reason that rules out accelerated expansion uh, thanks to some sort of form of energy uh, uh, if you think that inflation happened. And also if you've got an infoton field that's just another thing that's going to contract uh, that's, that's going to contribute to uh, this effect in lambda. There's a fairly clear anthropic limit, you are really just blowing the universe apart. You don't have to go too far up in cosmological constant before you've got one proton per observable universe. And nine, I'm going to go to a quote, uh, because I'm not fully understanding here, but this, this, you, you can't just say that this QFT calculation is totally wrong. Because the calculation of the vacuum energy is known to be correct in some environments. I'm going to uh, borrow someone else's authority on this. Uh, so this is from a paper by Kulczynski, uh, there's the reference. We know that the electron vacuum energy does gravitate in some situations, the vacuum polarization contribution to the famous Lamb shift. Since this is known to be a non-zero contribution to the energy of the atom, the equivalence principle that any form of energy gravitates requires that it couples to gravity. Thus, we must understand why the zero point energy gravitates in these environments and not in vacuum, or less than we think of. So you can't just say, uh, just, just kick out QFT, which is a bad idea anyway, because it's so successful. I've got one more plot, and then... Uh, so this is the number of time and space dimensions, which I've sort of mentioned already. So this is the number of macroscopic space dimensions, the big dimensions. So if there's rolled up little ones like in, in string theory, that's not on this plot. Um, and the number of time dimensions, uh, so we are here. The simplest cases are out that way. If you just add more space dimensions, uh, atoms are unstable and planetary orbits are unstable. Um, if you have two or one uh, space dimensions, then, well, if you're in two, then there are no gravitational fields in empty space. So having a, a something that will keep you at a nice distance from a star 
is uh, gravity won't help you with that. But plausibly, these are, are too simple for life anyway. So there's a, if you've ever read A Brief History of Time, there's this really bizarre plot that shows a two-dimensional dog, which has its feeding, it, its uh, sort of yeah, feeding tube going all the way through it. And in two dimensions, if you draw a feeding tube all the way through a dog, something food goes in, it cuts the dog in half. Right? There's nothing to join the other sides. Um, well, you, know, you can't have lines go over each other in two dimensions. They, they must intersect at some point. So plausibly, these might be just too simple. Things get a little weird when you start introducing things like more than one time dimension. So for example, let's out here. This is from a paper by Max Tegmark, and it's, it's a fairly really interesting sort of mathematical argument there. The way it goes is like this. Let's consider, we know how to write down, say, the wave equation in a certain number of dimensions. So if you're looking at waves on the ocean, they're two-dimensional waves, so you write down the two-dimensional wave. Sound waves are three-dimensional waves um, that move in three dimensions. Um, so we can write down, say, the wave equation, or more generally, just a, 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 a second-order linear partial differential equation. And the form of that equation will depend on the number of space and time dimensions. So the argument then goes like this. If you want to do something like predicting the future, what that involves is taking a slice through your space-time. Um, we usually do this along a slice of constant time looking at your surroundings, gathering a finite amount of information from a finite uh, region around you, and then solving those equations forward in time to work out what's going to happen if I drop this pen, or if I move my vocal cords and start talking to you. If you're up in this green region, or down in this region, um, if you take the space-time, take a one-dimensional slice through it, and then it is an ill-posed mathematical problem to use a finite amount of finite accuracy data on that slice to predict what the future will be like. Uh, that is the case that's being made. Uh, the other, so, if you want to store information, you need to know what happens when you put your pen on a piece of paper and draw or something. So, these universes are radically unpredictable at that, that kind of level. Question. Can you tell a little bit more about why we're doing this sort of slicing? In that, I mean, you might think there's an argument here about like, oh, the computer has a wall based structure, so no fiction in general, but I think it's much more limited than that, or I missing something. So he's basically trying to have a higher dimensional analogue of the way we predict the future by doing observations at a certain slice through space time and then predicting what will happen off that slice. I mean, so the thought is, I mean, as, as I said with other stuff, I guess, I mean, the fact that we do it this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You have to assume something. I think that's a plausible thing to assume. Uh, if you had a, if, if, well, the thought is there that uh, if you have more than one time dimension, an observer in that universe will still have their own personal one-dimensional time. You carry a clock with you, it will still tick. The clocks don't all become two-dimensional. You, you, an observer will still see a one-dimensional time. And so if they stop that, you know, you know, why? Stop that time. Why, why, why would why would that happen if it were two matches that the time? So uh, there is still proper time in the metric. So you can still draw a world line, and you can still calculate the time that would elapse on a clock that followed that world line. Okay. I'm all right. yeah, I, I, it, it's fishy. <laughs> you know, it, you're exactly right. Well, that clears it up. I always get stuck on this in plot. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, there are other problems. Uh, in our universe, there are you have energy and momentum. There is energy is a scalar, and momentum is yeah, x, y, and z. That has to do with this 3 plus 1. So if you're up here, energy becomes a vector, and so um, that you lose that simple... Uh, uh, if you have... The proton won't decay anytime soon, 
because there's no, it's a one dimensional thing and there's nowhere below it to, to jump to. There's no stable state underneath it in energy. If you make that a two dimensional plot and you lose that, that energy stability, it's much easier to sort of go on a trip through energy conservation and still land back where you are. Uh, yeah, I think uh, maybe you were about to explain this, but if you had meant to explain it before when you're talking about varying the time dimensions and it becomes unpredictable if there's more or less. I feel like if there's zero time dimensions, it's really easy to predict what's going to happen. Right? <laughs> Nothing's going to happen. Uh, the, the time, you know, the, the, what we do is extend basic wave equations that have time derivatives, and now there's no time derivatives. Yeah. There's nothing to calculate about the past or future, and it's pretty easy to tell that we're not in it. Um, I'm missing something. Why is it unpredictable? So, so that that was why you, you made a, a slice through the space time. If there's no time in one of those dimensions, you, you, you make a slice at a particular space and then try to predict the rest of the space. So the That's the, uh, the, the best like you can do of thinking dimensions. about. So you, I could just say clearly no time dimensions, no space dimensions, you know, nothing's going on in those universes. There's obviously not any room for, for anything that's going to think or interact or move or do anything. Um, but I'm trying to make a slightly stronger argument that even if you could imagine you know, in a, a three and zero universe, there's some sort of observer moving through it with their own um, I guess their own ruler or their own clock. Did I do that right? Space, yeah, rule, yeah, clock. Um, and then you, you try to sort of slice space time and predict what would happen in the future of my own world line. You, you, that, that can't be done. Okay, so, let, let so you sure. could just use a too simple in this theory as well. Yeah, uh, so, so as I understand it, then you can imagine having a two dimensional space and a one dimensional time, and if you have certain views on how time works, you might think that that's going to look like a three-dimensional cube, sort of in the end, because you have the two-dimensional thing evolving with time. But if you want to treat it as sort of one big object, you have this three-dimensional mm -hmm. object that describes the whole history of the two-dimensional surfaces. Now you're saying if there are just spatial dimensions, it will also look like a cube, and maybe there could be agents in it that would be deceived to thinking one of the space dimensions is a time dimension or something like that. Um, but what you're saying is if you just extend the wave equation in a normal way, they won't be able to predict anything about the future, and so it won't really look like a time dimension. None of the space Yeah, that's roughly it. I've stared at this plot long and hard, and I'm still not totally on it. That's the argument that Ted Mark is making. This is obviously very interesting if you're a string theorist, because you know, the, the, the options are that you've got loads of these other dimensions hanging around. You'd like to know why we're here. Well, maybe it's an improper thing. John? Uh, so I don't actually feel a lot of stuff in this plot very much at all, but it's, we might as well point out that this idea of no time dimensions is naively what you get from the wheel of the Whitaker. There's, there's no time in the wheel of the Whitaker, and h psi equals zero. And so the uh, proposed strategy is to, more or less like you were saying, just sort of in the opposite direction. Imagine that you have a block of metal with boundary conditions that are hot on the bottom, cold on the top, and insulating on the sides. And then it would have a temperature gradient. You could draw hypersurfaces of constant temperature. And you can even imagine Writing, the, writing an equation that looked like a time evolution equation from temperature to temperature. And so people have proposed that uh, that's how time emerges from the wheel of the Whitaker, that there's some variable that is really part of space, but then you can write an equation that the configuration obeys such that it looks like a time evolution equation in that variable. Uh, so I, I don't even think it's true that, uh, that, it, that zero is necessarily the well, I just, <clears throat> this is maybe, it, it seems to me what, sh what Sean just said is much more generally yeah, true yeah, than yeah, that. Yeah. That is, Absolutely. if you ask somebody, you know, you start, especially if you have, um, um, if you have this kind of union view of, of what it is to be a law that Chris was talking about um, this morning, <clears throat> you have some, you have some, uh, you know, in our world, you have some four-dimensional block, and it's, and it's uh, you know, and there's stuff smooshed all over it, okay? There are densities of various things smooshed all over it. It's decorated, as philosophers sometimes say, with properties. I prefer to say the foul. The <laughs> um, um, there's, there's, then you say, in a picture like this, What's the difference is what's the difference between the coordinates that you call time coordinates and the coordinates you call space coordinates? 
I take it, I take it a part of that difference just is that you notice that in certain slicings of this block, there are simple rules relating the conditions on one slicing to the conditions on another slice, either deterministic rules or probabilistic rules. If you slice it another way, there are no simple rules relating the conditions on one slicing to the conditions on another slicing. The, 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 the slicings where there is a simple rule relating them are, are, are what you call equal time slices or something like that, okay? Or slicings in the time coordinate. The, the slicings where there are no simple rules relating them are, are what you, you know, are, are slicings that are perpendicular to the space, uh, uh, to the space axes. I take it, at least in part, that's all we mean by, by the difference between space and time. It's all you. <laughs> <laughs> the difference on this plot is, is very much the... the the, um, I mean, this is just following up with what Sean yeah. is saying in, in a much more general way, and in that case, it would be true by definition, okay, like somebody was saying, that if there aren't any time coordinates, that just is another way of saying there aren't any slicings where there are simple rules connecting the, the physical situations okay. on the different slicings. Yeah. So, the, the, so, being unpredictable in this sense is just what you mean by there not being time coordinates. Yeah, so that's a different definition of what they mean by number of time and space dimensions has to do with the signature of, of, of the metric. Of the metric. Right, right, um, right, right. So how that, that maps on your definition is an interesting question. Right, okay. um, So I guess, I, I guess then you could say we have these different terms, we have these different coordinates with different signatures up here, but there are no, there are no directions you can slice space time which give you a nice, right. it, 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 Relationship between any slice and any other slice, right? And so, on um, my view, when I take it on the one that Sean was espousing, the right thing, you know, the, the simpler thing to say about that would be, oh, there just aren't any coordinates that behave like a time. That is, they don't play the role okay, in yeah, a dynamical yeah, theory that a, that a time does. Yeah. Right. So that would that would that seems to me to be a sort of. Uh, 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 this is very much the relativist picture right, of space right, and time. Right. That would be a, uh, the school mechanics maybe picture of what? Or, no, 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 we define the regions by the metric, but then we're assuming that the kind of laws they would have is like ours, which is adding more time derivatives or adding more spatial coordinates. And, and what they're saying is that, look, to have worlds in which things would be predictable, worlds in which things sort of, in which there looks like there's a time dimension when there are no dimensions with negative signature, you have to have different laws, the kind of laws that treat one of the spatial dimensions okay. as a time dimension. Right. So, right. so that's the way that you would have worlds like that. So right. be, if you like, this is sort of a slice through dimensions. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a very natural move to make, to say, add another space-time dimension in this, uh, space, say another space, another time dimension in this room, but have, have the, all the atoms bouncing around in the thermal equilibrium the same way. We, we know what the, the wave equation would look like. What would, what would sound waves do in that sort of universe? I think that's the sort of move that this, the, the way that this plot is stepping out but there are other ways to do it, and that's, uh, you know, even with all those other plots, right, the, the board is flat. It's all, I've only got two dimensions to work with, just try and step out into, into, you know, what things would be like if we started moving around these other, the other options. So was there a... Wait, I was just going to say, you want the law to be dimensions invariant, right, otherwise, saying that the metric looks like this would actually have a concept. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And so I think that's going to limit the kind of games you can play with, like, try to come up with a completely different idea of proportions. Yeah. So, I, uh, yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. 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 Alright, can I get rid of this? <laughs> <laughs> um, entropy is an obvious one. So we've seen not, you know, ridiculously large numbers like this. Um, so what, what, you know, with some measure, what measure of the initial yeah, for the sort of initial conditions give you a low entropy condition, like no universe is up. 
making the same calculation, but you always see these ridiculous numbers. This isn't quite the, the smallest number we've ever seen that uh, Chris showed, but nevertheless, it is. This is a small number. Is that a quote from the paper? It is a quote, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I liked it. I liked it a lot. Uh, entropy is very obvious, sort of uh, life permitting. Criterion, even if you say that there is a fluctuation, a Boltzmann brain, you still want there to be the, the sort of definite definition of that is that there has been an entropy fluctuation which life rides down. So we, we need some sort of entropy, entropy condition there. Uh, I was next going to discuss the flatness problem, but I guess we can just sort of cross that out now. It's, that's no longer around. Um, if you think there's a flatness problem, there's an obvious, um, fairly, a fairly straightforward anthropic. A condition there, if if at when the universe is one second old, the density is I think it's one part in ten to the sixteen too low, then you don't get any galaxies because the universe isn't dense enough. If it's far the other way, then the, the universe will recollapse before stars fire up and um, make any of the heavy, heavy elements or, or power in, in life. But if you solve the flatness problem, then don't worry about it. Um, without inflation. Uh, so inflation can also solve the anthropic problem. Um, let's, th there's a, a general lesson here which is, is, is sort of being boosted all the time. Because I, um, the, the case has been made that there is no flat, flatness problem. Suppose there was and suppose there was a fine tuning issue there. Does inflation solve that? You still want to ask, you want to then go to the knobs and dials of inflation and find out whether you've got a um, a generic sort of solution or a particular, you know, uh, specific solution? Do you have to fine-tune inflation in, for, in order for it to fine-tune the, the density of the universe? That's always a question you need to ask about these things. Is, is my fine-tuning solver as fine-tuned as the thing is uh, supposed to be solving? Let me run through a couple of um, bad, well, I think a, a bad cases. So you see, not in the scientific literature, thankfully, but I had a crap on the internet I think. The last of doing this uh, Charge me, Charlie. If, if um, gravity can win over electromagnetism, so the difference in the strength of those forces is, is in, say, an atom, is it's ridiculous. It's 10 to the 37 or something. The fact that how much stronger electromagnetism is. So the reason why uh, gravity is important in various situations is that. Uh, Electromagnetism can cancel itself out. But there's positive and negatives, and not enough of them together, then um, electromagnetism, there's, a, there's no sort of net force, very weak net force. You could upset that quite easily by having a universe in which was not charge neutral, and you only need it to sort of one part in 10 to the 37 to, to, for there to be no regime in which gravity wins. Probably. That's it. I think a, a bad case, a sort of stereotypically bad case, for the reason that um, there's no reason to think, well, um, zero is clearly a special value. So, for, so far as we know, zero is, is where our universe is at. There is a much positive charge and negative charge. So, how, how, so stepping away from that, you're, you're taking a step towards, a towards more, a more complex universe, be more difficult to predict what's going on in that universe. And uh, the sort of uh, there's good reasons to expect that some sort of symmetry will explain why uh, will explain why the universe is charge neutral. Same sort of idea for matter and antimatter. Um, if you have equal amounts of matter and antimatter, then you end up with a universe which, with almost no matter in it. We don't yet have a good theory, unless someone presented one in the last two weeks. No? Good. Uh, of matter and antimatter, so we're not sure what dials, you know, what would that ratio be if the fine structure constant was 10% bigger? I, I don't think anyone knows that question, so we don't know what would happen when you turn the dials. I'm not even sure what the dials are like to turn. I mean, it might be more accurate to say we have many theories that are perfectly plausible for the batteries that we used on which one and didn't yep. use that are correct. Okay. Yes. Uh, unlike the cosmological constant problem, yeah. in which case it is arguably no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> that's one of the yeah, one of the reasons why it's causing multiple constant problems. Um, good question of yours. I think it's a good idea um, not to talk about the fine tuning of anything that's got uh, dimensions on it. 
I think the first thing you want to do is set your, your unit's dimensions. Um, and, uh, that's a fine point. There are another sort of qual you know, qualitative, is the wrong word, but sort of general cases where you can go apart. So, Leonard Susskind in his book discusses what if you know, electrons are bosons instead of fermions, in which case you don't get uh, uh, the Pauli exclusion, you don't get the Pauli exclusion in principle, so you don't get the stability of atoms. So in a universe with uh, selectrons instead of electrons, you don't get atoms, you don't get life. If gravity was repulsive, you wouldn't, you know, the story of how stuff happens in astronomy is gravity crushing stuff together. If you turn that the other way around, then not much happened. Um, strong force plausibly has to be short range because it's strong. If it was long range, it would just overwhelm the other forces. It's a very rough argument. Uh, if electromagnetism uh, is the opposite to track fun, then if, if, if there wasn't positive and negative charges, you wouldn't get that cancellation, you wouldn't get uh, the gravity would never win because there would always be electromagnetism around. Quick gravity. comment about the gravity, Mark. Sorry. Yep. I mean, there were, on inflationary stories, there, there was sort of like a, a stage in which gravity was repulsive. Yeah. yeah. If, if, if that were true for all four of them. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't affect it. Yeah. Just swap a sign in GR or yeah. something. You need a quantum regime, as I said before, because atoms spiral into the, the neutrals. And I've. Three? Yes. Well, I am done for this section. So we're going to come back in the next one and just uh, cause a ruckus. Um, so I'll leave it there. Coffee.